presentation. Thanks a lot for attending today. Microphone motion sensor. Group members, Norm Hussain, Tracy Keller, Carlos Palomo, and Tiara Um, Quick question, like how many of you have ever watched wildlife documentaries? Where you see animals are analyzed by professors and researchers and scientists, and then they show you all that just one hour long show for two hours. Probably everybody did. But the question is, have you ever thought about the process? It takes them to record all that, have you ever showed how much it takes to just get this moments of interest? Today our project will be engaged in this process. Background. Working with the National Geographic in Washington, D.C., I've been using a creative camp system. It's basically <coughs> composed of two main things. High definition recording camera and environmental sensors. Parameter pressure, temperature, and so on. They've been adding on from version to version. They started first in water mammals, as you see here in Big Whip, and they moved forward to land mammals, tigers, lions, and bears. Now, what's the problem? The camera piece, they're trying to understand why there is a sharp decline in the population of an animal called the camera, and it's known also as a reindeer, basically in an area called Newfoundland, North America. Um, facts about the caribou, in just the last decade, 66% decline was mentioned only for the caribou in Newfoundland. And for also as a fact, 20-25% is basically low activity. It's basically sleeping, eating, or traveling from land to land in herds. 70 to 75 percent for our research is basically an active mood, which means like running away from like wolves, predators, like <coughs> lynx, and birds. Alright, moving forward, they will use the critic game system, but the critic game system basically is drawing a lot of power. The result is only running for several hours before the battery is dead. And remember, this system is embedded around the cooler of the animal. That means that after several hours, you have to go back, think about it from the cooler, and it's really a exhausting process. Our solution. Analyzing accelerations for triggered conditions to activate the print. And that will be explained in a few seconds. Requirements for our system? Provides a wake up signal to the printer camp system. Hey, there is an event of interest. You need to wake up. Self contained power with a battery in a school cell for indefinite operation, independent of the printer camp system. Recording all data collected in an SD card. Right. So I'm going to walk you through the architecture of our system and then get into some of the technical bugs a little bit. What you see here is our flowchart, or the logic control system. It's very simple, honestly. Uh, basically, the system sleeps while it's waiting for a, uh, a signal of interest on the accelerometer. When it gets the signal, uh, the signal is passed to the central processor on the parent unit on the uh, critter camera controller. And then that unit makes a decision to turn on the camera or not to turn on the camera. It may also pull in other information, like polling to find out where the other critter cams nearby are or checking its GPS location. And then, uh, while as long as the camera's on, it keeps evaluating that decision in the loop. And with, when it decides to turn the camera off, it puts the system back to sleep and listens for another signal of interest. So here are the technical components that we use to get there. The first two deal with signal processing. Uh, this, the accelerometer and the controller that you pull was chosen because it's very low power and has several sleep modes. And the last four, are the power, deal with the power of the system. It's a battery and the solar panel, the charger to interface the two, and then a switch mode power supply. Obviously, if you run the system at 2.8 volts instead of 3.3, you save a little power in the long run. So here is the block diagram, so you can see how these components are, are integrated. This is the power supply here on the bottom. It's uh, supplying our module, our module is the one on the left. And then the two doing the data processing, they pass the signal off to the parent module when they even appropriate. Now, this is, uh, I won't talk about this, but this is just the technical diagram which you all remember. Uh, this is what it looks like in real life. And there, there it is. Uh, so this is the inside of that black box. These, you can see the five components. Uh, I should take a moment to mention here that our project, as mentioned before, is more of a feasibility inquiry into uh, can this happen, can this thing really run on its own power indefinitely. So some of these components are off the shelf and for production this of course would be compressed on a component circuit board and uh, the footprint would be significant as well. Now, speak up, Jesse. Okay. All right, that concludes the architecture of the system and now <laughs> I'm going to walk you a little bit into one of the, some of the more technical things that is on the dig into the microcontroller, talk about uh, the power side of it and then the code side of it. So uh, power, it operates in three modes, sleep when there's uh, very small signals coming out of the accelerometer, 
the microcontroller goes to sleep. It draws all, very little current when it's, when it's asleep. And when it's processing data or passing data along, we determine that we can run it as low as one megahertz, which draws only uh, 400 microamps continuously. Now, when I need to log data to the SD card, uh, that does take four and a half milliamps, but fortunately, uh, at the data rate we're going, uh, data collection rate, I only need to do a log every 2.8 seconds, and the log takes 40 milliseconds in duration. That is, it's only logging data less than 1% of the time, so the, the power draw on the system to the logging data is very small. So, if we conservatively assume that our animal is at rest at least 25% of the time, uh, that is, it's a, the system is asleep 25% of the time, 75% of the time it's uh, pulling in data and logging it, then the total footprint of power footprint of the microcontroller is only 440 micrograms. Now, that's the power side. Uh, I, we keep making reference to a signal of interest or when you see something of interest, it's going to pass the signal off. What are we referring to? Well, based on a little bit of digging, we found that caribou, when there's predation or predators around, they run, of course. And fortunately, running is characterized by high spikes and accelerations, so that's our signature that we're looking for. Um, so here we tune the accelerometer and the controller to be looking for a certain threshold. If the signals are below that threshold of magnitude, it ignores them and sleeps, and if they're above that, it wakes up and does Here's an example of uh, the data coming in on three axes, and then the yellow signal is the interrupt firing saying, ooh, I see something interesting. So you can see the high spikes correspond to what might be running. Now Carlos is going to dig into the accelerometer. <coughs> Tested that accelerometer, we uh, had a human experiment where we designed a series of uh, movements to be performed. The movement consists of sitting, laying, jogging, running, and moving the head up and down. Uh, we experimented several times to make sure of this consistency in the signal. And here's uh, the signal of a human experiment. We have the X, Y, and Z axis. Uh, of, uh, we have an interval of uh, 10 seconds in between. We have the sitting, laying, running, and moving the head up and down. And for our animal experiment, we recorded a series of random movements for a dog where we analyzed the data and match it to the first category. And later on, we'll show you a little clips, uh, clip of the video that we And here's a signal of the dog moving. The top one is running at 50 hertz sampling, where uh, we uh, decimated the signal to 10 hertz. And as you can see, they are practically the identical. And by running at 50 <coughs> hertz, we use about 440 microamps. At 10 hertz, we use 120 microamps. So running at 20, 220 microamps is much better than uh, 50, uh, running at 440 to use 10 hertz. Okay, so um, now we move on to discuss some of the lighting characteristics. Um, it's very important to keep in mind our requirements for the system was to have a self-contained power supply, the battery, and the solar charger. So. Um, we first started off by testing our solar panel. Um, there's two conditions. One, where we have sunlight that's ideal to run our system. Um, in that case, the solar panel will be supplying current to the lithium ion charger, which then passes that onto the DC to DC converter and outputs a constant 2.8 volts to the system. Um, simultaneously, the leftover current from that lithium ion charger is uh, used to charge the battery. In the second condition, where there is no sunlight, uh, the solar panel will not be useful, so the system will be running completely on the lithium ion battery. Uh, the current from there will be passed through the lithium ion charger to the DC to DC converter, and again, the 2.8 volts will be supplied to the system. In testing our solar panel, we use a light meter uh, measured in lux to uh, get light different light intensities, and uh, also recorded voltages and currents for those different light intensities, and the prediction of the power that we can get from that. Um, and this number highlighted the 48,000 lux uh, corresponds to an 8.6 uh, 
milliamp current. So uh, we use that later in calculations. And this plot here just shows the linear relationship between light and current, whereas obviously uh, you get more light intensity, you get more current. So uh, considering that none of us have actually been to Farmland and we don't really know what to expect, we've done some digging online to find uh, specifically between the months of calving, uh, the calving season of uh, March through September, what we expect to get. And uh, taking the worst case, which is in March, we only have 11 hours of sun and 14% of that time is clear, mostly clear, and 9% of that time it's partly cloudy. So that's a, those are conditions where we can actually get some sunlight to power our system. Uh, that's a total of 23% of that 11 hours. So um, the angle of the sunlight also makes a huge difference in how much sunlight we get. Um, obviously at 900, sorry, at 90 degrees you get 130,000 lux. At 45 degrees you get about 77,000 lux. And at 15 degrees you get 19,000. So uh, taking the worst case scenario, assuming 45 degrees, 55, I'm sorry, uh, assuming 45 degrees 50% of the time, and some other bad angle, say like 10 degrees, 50% uh, of the time, we multiply the light intensities for those measurements and come up with an average of 46,000 lux. And uh, from our previous recording, we determined that 46,000 lux corresponds to 8.6 million. Multiplying that by the 23% of the time that we actually expect to get some sunlight uh, and the 11 hours out of 24 hours a day that we'll have sunlight, we come up with 0.9 milliamps or a 900 microamp average. And this is just a demonstration of our animal testing that we've done. That's what you like. Thank you so much. 